The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. All right. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna have one more talk. This talk is going to um, be a brief overview of. So, in the first couple of talks, we talked about the core concept of Salt, and that is remote, and that's the remote execution of the modules. We talked about how to get started with states in the second talk, and then we talked about how to um, how to get started with actually developing and extending Salt in the last one. Now, in this one, what we're going to go over is a pretty brief overview of how to extend salt in, in four more ways in code. And then we're going to talk very briefly about a few other aspects of salt to be aware of. Now, a lot of these things that we're going to talk about, we're not going to talk about in depth. It's just going to be a quick introduction that, to say that there are a lot of little pieces out here that can be useful, hopefully just to get uh, get your minds in this um, in a mindset that uh, realizes that well there's some things in these different directions that you could be aware of that you can look into in more depth in the future because we don't have enough time to cover them all in extreme depth so all right all right so primarily I mentioned that there are six ways to extend salt via the code and the two ways that we covered modules and states and then we've got grains, returners, renderers, and runners. And so we're going to spend some time talking about what those are, how they work, and a few reasons as to why you might want to extend them. So grains. There's a number of ways in which you can add grains to a minion. Now, if you've got... Um, if you open up the minion configuration file, you can statically assign grains right in there. So that you can open the config file, put some arbitrary values in there, and bam, you've got more grains. That's the easiest way to do it. And I'll demonstrate that here in a moment. Um, but also, you can extend grains by adding more grains modules into the code itself. So that you can make another mechanism that's going to discover some system properties or properties of some sort. That are going that's going to return data. Now, a really good example of this. I was talking to a company, Jive Communications. Um, they're they're one of our earliest uh, adopters. And I was talking to them back in January about Salt, and they wanted to integrate their Salt system with some of the components of their existing provisioning and management systems that they'd built in house. And their existing system, they would hit an HTTP server somewhere and grab some some data, and then integrate that um, into, their, into their deployment scripts. And they said, we'd love to still be able to grab that data and imp implement it in Salt. And I said, well, that'll be a custom grain, you see. You write a module that returns a dictionary, and, um, and you put it in there, and it, then it'll work. Well, we'll talk about that in a few minutes, is what I told them. And a few minutes passed, and one of them in the back does one of these. <laughs> and he says, I got it to work. I got a grain that integrates our existing deployment system directly into SALT. So they can, it can be very useful. And um, it's one of those interfaces that emphasizes the fact that one of the core goals of SALT is that it will mold to your environment and your needs as opposed to you needing to change any of, um, any of your own internal Turn of processes as much. So let's see. Let's take a quick look at how these grains work. Right now we've got our core grain module here. Same thing that just a Python module. If there's a underscore in front of it, it won't be executed. But this is a little different. How grains works is that it'll go through and execute these, 
these functions and then just append the dictionary that's returned to the existing grains. So if you want to add some grains, you can chuck some functions in here or add some more grain modules into that directory and they'll get automatically loaded. As so we can see, for instance, that we go through and we, we figure out what, what, the, what the operating system is, add some keys into this dictionary, and then just return it. Actually, this is a better example. That one's nice and brief. That we're going to figure out what the host name and the fully qualified domain name and whatnot is and then return it. And they all get appended. All right. Oh, and I wanted to mention if we go into the minion config file here, So now I've made a grain called foo with the value of bar. There it is. So we can statically add grains to the config file. Any questions on that? Okay. Salt returners. Now, the idea here is, and one of the core ideas of Salt's remote execution system is that it is fundamentally detached. What that means is that when you execute a command, the master isn't, doesn't have a persistent TCP connection waiting for that command to return, which means that this information can be redirected to any other location that you really want. It doesn't have to come back to the master. Now, the benefit here is that you can very easily set up, say, a script that's running on the master that every now and then says, I want, I want a Mongo or an SQL or a Redis server or something like that to just have this data sent over to it every X number of minutes or seconds. So it's got this, this built-in mechanism to make the minion cache data. And so to add a returner, let's take a look at one. And then I'll show how to use one. So here's our Cassandra returner. This is another thing that Jive Communications gave us since I've already mentioned them today. OK. Setting up a returner is pretty straightforward. All you need to do is have a function in here called returner. That function is going to get called, and it's going to receive a data structure that has the return data from the actual call. That return data, or this ret as it is in this, in this returner, is going to have three keys. Um, those keys will be, let's see if I'm looking for, here we go. Oh yeah, no, it's four. I apologize. <laughs> Those are going to be the function that was actually called. So it could be, it could have been test.pain, could have been package.installed or state.highState. state. It's going to be the minions ID that's actually returning the data. It's going to be the return data itself. So this is what's actually returned from the function inside of the modules. And then the job ID. Because every time we launch a job, every time we launch a command in salt, there's a job ID that's associated with it so that we can track historically um, exactly what happened with respect to that singular execution. And so you've got access to that data. And in this case, we're just connecting to a Cassandra server and sending the data off in, in what is going to be a consistent format. So hopefully. Hopefully that um, 61 lines of Python code isn't too particularly daunting for anyone who's trying to write something that's going to return this information to a, to a uh, to say, a database. Now, to use returners, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a 
Cassandra or a Mongo or a Redis or anything like that set up right now. So there's a limit to my, my demo. But we run the command. And then specify dash dash return and say what returner to use. We can pass a comma delimited list of returners as well so that if you could say, I want it to be sent to these five returners, then that's, that's also possible. All right. We've, got, we've had a, a few more people use renderers. Um, again, as I mentioned, when you define SLS files for the state tree, when you're defining your configuration management, it's all a data structure. We don't care how you get it. But um, we've got to have some mechanism to turn that, that information into the data structure. And so we do that inside of renderers. So if we take a look at the default renderer, it's actually not too particularly complicated. All we're doing here is we're taking this information that I mentioned before, the salt, the grains, and the options and everything, making those available inside of the file, rendering the, uh, running it through the Jinja templating engine, and then running it through YAML and returning the raw data. So similarly, the Mako renderer is fairly popular. And yeah, as far as the code goes, we're looking at, what was that, 26 lines of real code to make it happen. But so again, fundamentally, the renderer is the way in which you extend salt to accept a different type of SLS format if you don't want to use the default. Now, uh, quickly, when you're writing renderers, they've primarily, they primarily take three arguments. Those have to be available, or else your renderer will throw a stack trace. Um, there's got to be the, the template file. That's going to be the file that's available. Or sorry, the, file, uh, the template file itself. And Salt's going to pass to the renderer the location of that template file for you to render. And then you need to accept the environment and the SLS. And those are pieces of data that you embed uh, so that uh, so the state system is able to track where rendered files have come from. OK. So that, cov that, that, that covers actually everything but runners. But before we can get into runners, we have to mention the, the API. So I've, I've gone over how to call salt commands from the command line. But to actually run the executions from Python directly, you don't need to shell out. You can directly call the API. And there's a lot of functions inside of the API um, that are useful. So. Actually, I'll just do this in, uh, in a Python shell here. So the salt, uh, salt out client library is where the API is located. When we, create a, when we create a client object, um, it's, we, we make that instance out of the local client. And we just have to pass it the location of the master's config file. Because it's going to have to read information about the master's config file to attach to the master to send out a command. OK.
And then I need to remember. Oh, that's right, that's right. The target. Of course. And so the same constructs that we're using on the command line are available in here and in the same order. The target, um, the function. If we were passing arguments, then we would have a list, uh, a list and then a comma separated list of what the arguments are. If we were using something other than the default target, then we would, then we would say the expression form equals grain or something else. And we're able to execute Python call or uh, salt calls directly from Python. Okay. So the gist here is that it's very straightforward to be able to uh, execute commands and write your own scripts or your own applications on top of salt's communication that's still using it to run all of the run all of your commands, query data, and then bring all of that back. So fundamentally extensible in that way. Now, inside of that local object that we created, we've got the CMD command, which is a classic, just send a single command and get our return back. CMD CLI is also going to print a bunch of things to the terminal. It's what the salt command itself uses. We've also got CMD iter. So normally, when a salt when the uh, when the salt command runs, it's going to execute. It, it publishes the command that everybody needs to run, and then it detaches and just kind of waits for them to all re respond. And then as all of the minions reply, they're ingested one at a time and then sent back to the command. And so the basic command here just waits for all of the minions to reply and then sends all of their returns back at once. Whereas we can use an iterator command to say that um, it creates it creates a Python generator for those of you familiar with this, but um, but it allows you to re retrieve the information about who's executed one at a time as they come in. So it's really good for uh, um, gen generally used by people who have built some web interfaces to salt because it's uh, it's capable of using web sockets and they run a command and you can actually see on their web pages components filling up as the minions reply from the queries. All right. The last way to, the last um, common mechanism used to extend salt is called a runner. Now, a runner, the concept here is that if you want to write a specific purpose script that executes a more complicated sequence in salt, you can drop it in and make it a runner and then call it with the salt run command. It's a, it's a really good way to build out specialized reports and a really good way to, uh, to make some of the more complicated things that you might do more convenient. There's a couple of built-in runners, so we run them with salt run. We can say salt run manage dot up to say who's everybody that's responding. Manage dot down to say who isn't responding. Nobody. It's easy to track just one, isn't it? <laughs> Similarly, we can do Uh, there's a runner that manages jobs. Let me check the documentation here real quick. Perfect. Thank you. And so I can go back and use this jobs runner to list every execution that I have sent out of this master so long as we've maintained the cache of jobs. By default, they're maintained for 24 hours. Now, but so we can see that this last test stop ping that I executed from the from uh, the Python API was cached. Here's its job ID, 
um, which is actually kind of a timestamp there. So 2012, um, the 10th, 12, 24, etc. We know what arguments were passed. We know what time it started. We know who was intended to execute it, etc. We can use this job runner here to read what that historic response was from that job ID. So we can go in and, again, look at everything that's happened in the past and query it back through. So those are runners. And really, the job interface is a very useful thing to be aware of. Any questions? Okay. When, when you're developing runners, modules, states, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, we, do, we do have a full testing system in place. So you can add tests to verify that, that your code is working on a continual basis. Now, to run the tests, all you've got to do is cd into the test directory, make sure that your modules are in there and that your, test, that your tests are in there. They don't need to be run as root, but I've got a funny configuration on this laptop right now that goes crazy if I don't. The test system is, is pretty thorough. What it does, or what it's, what it's been doing up there, is that it actually starts up two master servers, a syndic, and two minions. So that it builds a, a hierarchy and builds out some minions so that these tests are not just unit tests, but they're running on live um, salt infrastructure. That's all running as the user that you started as, and they all cleanly die when you're done. But so we're able to embed any tests that we want to and ver verify them very, very easily. Now we're going to um, we're going we're going to have what we're calling the the first great salt sprint here on the 30th of June. Um, it's sponsored by the Linux Fund, and um, their main uh, the main goal and one of the reasons why they gave us the money is to help us um, build out more tests for salt because right now we've only got maybe 30 percent coverage. Um, and we've got a, uh, and this, this development sprint has been done in a real salt fashion. It's distributed. So we have the sprint is going on simultaneously in three different locations. We've got one location in Salt Lake City, another in Silicon Valley, and another up in Portland, Oregon, where we've got teams of guys coming together all to develop salt code. So it's going to be really exciting. If anybody wants to, if I, I don't, we don't have one down in, down in the south right now. Um, but if anybody wants to be involved in that, go ahead and uh, check online, check the webpage on the 30th, and we'll have instructions on how to hop in the video feed so that, uh, so that anybody anywhere can be involved in helping us write some salt code. And the goal of this sprint, like I said, is to make our tests better. But as usual, we, we like patches of all sorts as long as they're not just wrong. <laughs> but yeah, we really like module editions and test editions.
Now, there's two more interfaces that I want to talk about that were in the next, that, that I, I did prepare another, um, another presentation, but I don't think that we're going to have enough time to go into it because we've got a lot of flights that are starting to go out. So that and our numbers have already waned considerably. <laughs> yeah, well, then that's not a good enough reason. <laughs> it's <laughs> All right. So there's two more interfaces inside of SALT that I want to talk about. And I don't have a whiteboard. They're, they're so whiteboard type things. But all of the communication that we've been talking about so far has been based on a master sending out commands to minions. But there's, there's two more interfaces that we can work with in SALT. One of them, and I mentioned it very brief, briefly, is called a syndic, um, and meaning to syndicate. So if, say you've got four data centers, or say you've got one data center that's just really big, and you go, well, sure, I could attach 30,000 minions to my, my one salt master, but that's more than I want to deal with logically anyway. And so instead, we'll say, let's take a salt master here and give it about 200, and here and give it about 200, et cetera, so that you've got a number of salt masters. And maybe you'll have salt masters at every one of your data centers. So say you've got five data centers, and so you've got a data center, it's got its, it's, got its master, it's got its minions, and they're all over the world or all over the country. But you still want to be able to control all of them from one central location. And so what you do is you set up what we call a syndic. And the syndic is like a, it's like a bridge that allows you to take one of these salt masters in one of your data centers and then tie it into a higher level master up here so that you may have these five data centers and they all report back to this higher level master. And so this guy can now send commands out to every data center or gather information from every data center in a unified place. The other thing about the Syndic interface is that it is a completely transparent interface. What this means is that this higher level master could have direct minions of its own. And it could have, you could have a master of a master of a master of a master with minions on every layer and build whatever insane topology you wanted. Because I don't, I'm not going to try and predict how you're going to make your data center. And I've, I've seen some real doozies. <laughs> so I'll let people do what they want. Yes? The, the question was, in that type of complicated uh, um, environment, which of the masters have access to which of the minions? Now, a master, a master has minions directly connected to it, okay? And so it only can see its own minions. If you've got a master over here and a master over here, and they've got their own minions, and they're tied together with a syndic, then this guy cannot see this guy's minions. But this guy can see both of their minions. Make sense? Right, but not parallel. Okay. Sorry? Okay. Right. Sorry? Correct. Um, all right, so that's the Syndic interface. It's actually very, uh, very easy to configure. I haven't accounted for a new thing that I changed. Looks like I need to add another test. <laughs> All right. So So if we look down at the syntax settings in here, So we see that 
Yeah. Yes, yes, I know. All right. So there's two settings to manage syndics. So it's really simple in the master config. You set a syndic master. So if you're on a master with minions who wants to report to a higher level, you say syndic master equals wherever this guy up here is. And then this guy up here needs to have orders, order masters equal to true. And then it works. That's, that's all it takes. And the only reason you need order masters up here set to true is because it adds a little more information to the publications that are sent out. And down here, master of masters, you just need to know where that higher level guy is. Once those are configured, you start up a daemon called Assault Syndic. And that Assault Syndic daemon does all the bridge work for you. So very straightforward. Two configs in two places. Or one config in two places. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about, and this, this is going to be the last thing, and then we'll have, and then any, if, if you guys have any questions or anything, that I want to talk about is peer communication. Now, by default, peer communication is turned off, and I think you'll, you'll understand why when I start explaining what it is. But peer communication allows, so you've got a master and you've got minions. Peer communication allows a minion to send publications to other minions. Now this could be a, a fairly serious security risk. Because it's already kind of dangerous if your master gets compromised, then whoever compromised it now owns everything. Because they can send out commands. We don't want to make it so that every single system you have, if it gets compromised, can, uh, can compromise everything else. That's bad. But so the peer system allows you to open up specific minions to be able to execute um, specific commands. So in this case, we're saying that if we've got a minion, foo.example.com, it has access to all of the test and package functions, okay? Now this is very useful if you've got a minion down here who has an event and that event needs to be able to trigger events someplace else so that you can use cross communication. Also, um, in the next release of SALT, we just finished building in um, the peer run interface so that you can open up minions to be able to execute a runner on the master and then get that data back on the minion. So that a minion itself would be able to integrate in such a way to gather information about everything else specific to one of the runner's reports. All right. That's what I've got. So, so my question to you guys is, is there, is there anything else that you want me to talk about a little bit more before we call it quits? Do you guys have any questions um, or, any, uh, or any use cases or anything that you want to go over before, uh, before we, we shut, this, shut this showboat down? Well, they don't use it as a package manager. They use it to automate the setup of their build system. Oh, the build system. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, have you ever found, found your um, program, software, whatever you want to call it, I've been used in any kind of weird ways, but you quite haven't seen it quite in a way you haven't thought of it being used before? A lot. Can you give some examples? Um, so there's, there's a startup in Europe um, called 30 Loops that's using Salt. And they actually came in and refined a lot of the peer interface. Because what they're doing is they've got a bunch of Django systems. And these Django systems, when an event happens on one, then it needs to be able to trigger a, modifi a system modification on another system in the architecture. 
And so they're able to take in a signal from, from that gets fired on one Django server and then use it to start up um, uh, to like start up a database someplace else, so that they're using these arbitrary communication bridges. We've all, um, I've also seen that done. Um, yeah, that's sorry. Is that done with peer publishing? Yes, that's done with peer publishing. Um, most most of the really wonky things I've seen have been done with peer publishing, but also also a lot of the things that I really didn't expect were. Um, the ways in which people have integrated it with a lot of their existing infrastructures, where they've come back and said that we've got we've got like this data set, well, like this this Jive communications thing, um, and they're they're a VoIP company, but all of their all their servers that they were starting up, again needed this interesting data set, and they were going out and grabbing it with grains, and so so yeah, I didn't expect that. Um, we've also got guys that are using it to. Um, to integrate, uh, to integrate part of their storage services. So there's another startup that's doing um, storage as a service that's using Salt, and and what they're doing. Um, this is also a peer communication thing, but what they're doing is they're firing off events in different locations to reallocate disk space for certain tasks. Um, Another another thing that I thought was really cool was uh, was our use in supercomputers. There's there's a number of universities that are using Salt um, inside of their supercomputers to manage not only setting up and maintaining their supercompute nodes, uh, but also using it to um, uh, to manage the soup, manage the jobs that are running on a lot of their supercomputers. And I, I really didn't see that one coming. Um, and so now we're looking into developing some, some front ends that are specific to potentially the management of supercomputing. Um, that, and, and I've been, honestly, I've been surprised by, um, I, can't, I can't mention all of them quite yet, we're still working that out, but, but I've been surprised by how many very large companies are using SALT. And the fact that um, even though we're really young, uh, that yeah, we're we're being used by guys that are that are pretty big players, that are, that have come out and found us and already replaced um, existing infrastructure from from some of the other players in the area with us and done it very very rapidly. Um, a lot of it's been done in uh, well not not a whole lot of time. Yes. Yes. The question was, have I seen Salt been used to provision virtual machine hosts? And um, uh, that's actually what I wrote it for, <laughs> uh, was, was to be the backplane for a cloud controller. Um, and, and we've got a prototype cloud controller that I would not recommend using um, called Butter <laughs> um, that, uh, that is specifically controls KVM virtual machines. And, um, and KVM hypervisors. But um, yeah, it's something that I'd like to do down the road, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Oh yeah, definitely has, the, has that potential. I was gonna say, and if, if, you're, if you're interested in working on something to that effect, I'd love to collaborate on it. Um, because again, that was, that was the original intent. Was for was for the remote execution to manage the distribution, creation, migration, and maintenance of virtual machines. And that was the original problem set as to why I made the remote X, and why I wanted it to be fast, it was so that I could have it connected to an API that was querying um, the status of virtual machines. It's just that the general market demand has moved in the direction of configuration management a little more. <laughs> There, there are. Oh yeah, and and a lot of them have matured a lot since I originally wrote Salt, um, and 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 which is why I'm not entirely sure that that's going to be the the long term thing that we use it for, 
but um, but with that said, I do know of people and companies that have been using Salt in tandem with things like CloudStack and OpenStack um, to manage to manage those to manage and or integrate with those cloud controllers. So you can know that they get things up and running, and then they use Salt to figure it out. Yeah. So they'll use something like OpenStack for the actual deployment of the virtual machines. But then once those virtual machines come online, then they check into the salt master and they finish up their configurations. And then they're still able to use them to get all that live state data or run commands everywhere. Um, at this point, probably. Uh, but the, the nice thing about, about the SALT approach is that you could, and, and we didn't talk about like the SALT file server in a lot of depth or any of that, um, but, but you could very, very well deploy and manage virtual machines with SALT quickly. SALT? Well, and I, and I think it will be. And, and the, uh, the ideas that I've got for building a cloud controller with SALT is able to use some of the same techniques. Like we talked about those virtual functions and how, and how a virtual function can map, func map generic functionality back. Um, one, one thing that I'd really like to do with a cloud controller, if it becomes a priority, is to make it fundamentally generic. And so that cloud controller is... Um, is able to communicate with everything from FreeBSD jails to OpenVZ and KVM and Zen. So that, so that you've got this ubiquitous cloud controller that would be able to seamlessly merge an infrastructure that's got um, FreeBSD jails over here and KVM over here or OpenVZ over here. Um, not, not so much that you would necessarily want to do that, <laughs> but so much that it's fundamentally that flexible. Um, and actually, I have been in a number of situations where I felt as though it would be compelling to be able to have different container types because certain, certain services, in my opinion, work better in VMs and certain services work better in a jail environment. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on what you're doing. And, and I'd like to be able to have a system that fundamentally um, uh, offers those sorts of flexibilities. flexibilities. Okay. You got nothing, huh, Clint? Oh, I got lots of questions. I just don't really. Right, right. <laughs> okay, so, so you'll keep me busy at the airport. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking about Okay. We've, we've actually had some guys use, uh, it was funny, we had some guys use, uh, make some custom renderers at one, uh, at one of our users, and they made custom renderers so that they could inject even more information into the renderer. And they showed them to me, and I said, oh, you want to do that? And so, yeah, we changed part of how renderers work so that it's easier to just custom inject extra data into, like, uh, into the default ones. Uh huh. And there's no value in rewriting or changing the YAML when you already have all the rules written into their, their way of doing it. So to be able to grab a boom to convert them into salt without going back to write YAML again. Yeah. Like, oh, it makes salt simple. And I know it can be done. I know you touched on some where two that at least have the rules that go into that. Yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely possible. And I mean, the mechanism would be along the lines of using. Say, say it was Puppet. The, the, the mechanism would be along the lines of the fact that when you, when you have Puppet data, it actually it gets pushed back to a certain extent to, um, uh, to be values and objects. And at that point, then we would take those values and objects and then map them over to salt data structures. Yeah. 
The, the downside to that is that, frankly, a, a lot of guys that have switched have said that it's gone pretty, pretty quick anyway. Oh, yeah. You've got, I don't know, 50 or so classes, and, and uh, you know, a whole bunch of modules, and you build up, and you don't need to reorder your infrastructure itself. You've got guys that are just pretty stuck on, on one thing, and they don't want to spend the time to take that. Once you decide to do it, it won't be a hard problem to solve. It's just convincing people that it can be done. And if you're like, Yes. No, that would be nice. Yeah, there's, I think there's some technical problems, but, I, but yeah, you're right. There's nothing insurmountable there. Um, also, to your question earlier about the define statement, um, a lot of guys are using Jinja uh, macros. I'm not going to argue with you, yeah, so but yeah. Okay. All right. We good? Everybody's sufficiently satisfied? Hopefully not. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. 
And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digim, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.